better. He's, yeah. our, he's our guy, Dr. Yeah, Jeff yeah, Mason yeah. from Everbona Joint. We, we, uh, it's written on here. It's track season is starting. Track season, and uh, the weather's getting nice, and people will be out running and, and moving around a lot more. And we were going to talk about stress fractures, right? Okay, yeah, yeah. absolutely. So, I mean, runners sometimes have these um, hard-to-diagnose stress fractures, particularly I think we talk about the second metatarsal. Uh, and it, it otherwise known as a march fracture in the right. old days. Tell us about that. Well, they were called march fractures because sh- soldiers used to get them, particularly when they were in boot camp, and they get other stress fractures as well. And what a stress fracture is is when the, shall we say, the accumulation of stress and the slow breakdown of bone is happening more rapidly than the body's response to heal it because you know bone is living tissue so whatever you do is constantly working and remodeling and if you're breaking it down faster than it remodels you will eventually get a stress fracture and they occur in typical areas like i said the second metatarsal is perhaps the most common but you see tibial stress fractures you'll even see femoral stress fractures um and they're very frustrating to the person involved because they just they have this um, often somewhat insidious, not extremely sudden onset of discomfort, and they can't figure out what's going on. And the problem with is, you know, they get a diagnosis, but this is a fracture that because there's not, it's not a dramatic trauma, which initiates a dramatic healing response, so they tend to heal quite slowly. And here you often have someone who's just starting their track season or their other, you know, some level of athletic participation. Then you say, well, now you have to sit around till it gets better. So there's a, a significantly high incidence of people re-injuring them when they think they're healed or not being as compliant as anyone would like them to be because they're trying to be out there competing, you know, they're they're very irritating. Right. So, I mean, technically, in uh, what you're talking about is this is a fracture based on overuse, so there's not a traumatic event uh, that people can recognize. It's right. just what are the classic signs of a stress fracture? Well, people often it'll be when they've just started to increase their activity, such as you know the track season or some other participation is ramping up, and they'll be you know in their workouts and after a short period of time, the season is just getting established, and all of a sudden they'll just start developing pain. They'll, for example, be do, be running laps and they'll say, "Well, my my foot started to hurt." And it wasn't very bad, but I realized that it was getting worse rather than getting better. And, gee, I tried to ignore it, and then it got worse. And now it hurts a little bit all the time. And if I walk on it, it hurts a bit more. And if I run on it, it's miserable. And and is there um, a, a diagnostic uh, challenge? Because if it's a stress fracture, is it true that sometimes a typical X-ray won't even pick up the stress? There are many times when it will not be seen on X-ray, uh, especially if it's fairly uh, acute. If it's been there a while and there's some healing response, you can see it on x-rays. MRIs will diagnose it with great effectiveness. It is, uh, as far as like track season goes, is it something that this happens more with sprinters as opposed to long-distance runners? Um, we see it more in long-distance runners, yes. But it, it can happen to anyone. We see just it from more the in pounding? long-distance runners. It, it, well, it's just a matter of, yeah, the miles they put in. I mean, sprinters, sprinters work hard, but they don't put in the miles. Right. That, you know, they... They're more intensity, less duration. I mean, and you just mentioned that an MRI will typically pick it up. But um, years ago, we used to talk about you don't use bone scan anymore. No, not so much. Just because the the MRI is just more effective, um, you know, fewer false negatives. It will show other things also. So you'll get the, the sort of the, the associated issues. Sometimes it'll show you you don't have a stress fracture. You have something else instead. So it's a good study for this. So, I mean, uh, more common in, in certain age ranges? I mean, male, female, is there anything gender or age-related? I mean, I know sometimes we talk about the, 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 the female triad. Right. Uh, you know, I mean, these are these lean athletes, yeah. runners and gymnasts and stuff, and they're losing bone density because exactly. they're not, their diet's wrong, right? Yeah, so we do see it more often in women than men. In, um, in, in any age, age range in particular? No, actually, I mean, I, you, I've seen it even in, in, I mean, put it this way. With women, once you get to... You know, if you become, if you get into a population that's truly elderly, then they can start having in what we call insufficiency fractures, even though the mechanism is the same as a stress fracture. This is someone who's getting there not because her activity level is so high, but because her bone is so bad. And so they can have what amounts to a stress fracture, but they haven't started track. They're just going through their life. And so um, we see it more in women than men. 
Interesting. And, yeah, it, it is. It's a, it's it's hard to diagnose. I mean, sometimes not only for you as a, a, a physician, I mean, you probably pick it up pretty easily, but sometimes patients wait a long time thinking this is going to go away. So the telltale sign is activity and pain, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, the notion of denial, which is the first thing that comes up with so many injuries, it's a pretty darn normal human response. Right. Right. You know, so we've you all get been pain, hurt. You yeah. run through it for a little bit. Right. A lot of right. runners try, and yeah. a lot of runners don't want to. Uh, you know, a lot of runners, particularly that um, category of runners that like that long distance running and and that endorphin and all that stuff they're looking for when they run long distances, they don't want to stop. Yeah. Years ago, we had someone come into the office who had a stress fracture. He was a young man, and when it, it turned out that he was training over 120 miles a week. Wow. And and he said, and now I have a stress fracture, and we we're all. Really? Yeah. I, I feel a little stressed just hearing the story. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, speaking of treatment, I mean, how do you treat it? I mean, do you have to just shut down all activity? I mean, pretty much. Yeah, it, it's it's they people get very frustrated. And do you ever have to do any kind of um, surgical intervention uh, for stimulation of bone growth or activity? Um, typically not. I mean, the the one, for example, if someone's getting a stress fracture in their femoral neck in the superior lateral part of the femoral neck, you probably put a screw in that, but. Most more often we don't operate on them. It's it's quite uncommon to have to operate on them. Uh, do people ever you shut them down and and their body just won't heal? I mean, uh, we we've heard of bone stimulation or bone stimulators. I mean, is this a technique or procedure you might have to use? Bone stimulators. Well, one you know the insurance companies watch that stuff carefully, and thus far, while bone stimulators are often um, approved for fractures after about six weeks duration with a stress fracture you're hoping in that time frame that you no longer need it so i don't think i've ever had to use a bone stimulator on one of these but you know theoretically it could be necessary i don't even know i don't even think i want to know what a bone stimulator is well ask the doctor what is a bone stimulator bone stimulators are devices and some of them use ultrasound but more often they use electrical pulses long ago it was discovered that you know, bone is actually among its other astonishing qualities. Has a lot of le- electrical activity. Um, it has nothing to do with nerve function, but it has electrical activity. And they found that by rapidly changing uh, the polarity of, you know, so, so basically setting up these tiny little currents across the fracture site, you could potentially uh, speed healing. And and it's one of those things where it's very difficult to demonstrate this scientifically, and there have been lots of studies that show that they don't work, but pretty much anyone in orthopedics who's used them for this and that, we're pretty sure that they often have a, a very salutary effect on healing. And, and the reality is what we've learned over the years, I mean, you know, if you go back 40 years ago, you fractured your femur, they put you on bed rest. I mean, right. yeah. and in today's world, because of that effect that you're just describing, the force being created through the bone actually stimulates calcium or deposit bone growth. Right. So now that's why we get people out of bed. I mean, you know, you used yeah. to be in a body cast. I mean, right. you fractured your femur, they put you in a spike, a spike of cast, you're in bed for eight weeks, you just laid there. And now the theory is get these people moving. Well, the- I had my knee replaced and I was up walking that, that day. Well, the first intramedullary rods ever on seen. On drugs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and yeah, a bone stimulator, yeah. I think. I yeah, don't yeah. even know. <laughs> the first rods ever seen in the United States actually came back in the long bones of American flyers shot down over Germany in World War II. And the Germans had been working on intramedullary rods. And these people came back. And at first, you know, they were thought to have been subjected to these, you know, horrible medical experiments. And the guy's like, no, I, I woke up from anesthesia and I had a couple little incisions in my leg and I was walking around with crutches a day later. I wasn't in traction for 16 weeks. Right. I broke it hitting a tree when I you know jumped out of my flaming B-17. So these were POWs yeah. that had surgical intervention by German doctors that were using these intermedullary rods yeah, yeah. and getting these people moving. Yes. Yeah, and then we've learned over the I mean, that's why, I mean, you know, as a therapist, I mean, you used to have to go in the day after surgery. Someone like you, Maury, had a total knee. The next day, we'd come in and say, okay, time to get out of bed. And they're like looking at you. Are you crazy? I'm getting out of bed. I've just got this, you know, yeah. scar in my, my knee, and I've got this total joint. And getting them moving, not only for bone, but just general kind of health of all the organs. And I'm getting them out of bed and getting them moving. So, I mean, uh, is there any dietary things you suggest as far as preventing stress fractures? Anybody? So, I guess the question is, if someone's had a stress fracture before... And it heals, and they start to get active again. Are they predisposed to have another fracture? They probably are. My what I tell patients all the time is, remarkably, a remarkably large number of Americans, particularly women, but also men, do not get enough calcium, do not get enough uh, vitamin D, 
don't have diets that are as healthy as they should be considering how many calories we take in. So I tell people to supplement both of those. There's no real downside to doing it. Good stuff. I think vitamin K is the big one today uh, for bone bone uh, enhancement. This segment so. is brought to you by vitamin K. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Everboneandjoy.com, Dr. Jeff Mason. Thanks for coming on with us. My pleasure.